If you go to yeah, I can't get it to like it's so it's gonna show up there probably because you're an extended. So oh, there's a mouse. Okay, perfect. Yeah, if you go if you go up to the more and then go to five. Um, there we go. There you go. And it's, it's, it's escape on the keyboard now. Escape. Escape. Why would I hit escape? Come back. Oh, I don't want it to come back. I want okay. it to stay gone. But if you were to need it to come back, you can go back. And okay. It's escape to bring it up. There it goes. Oh, perfect. It comes up and then just go back to the dot, dot, dot. Hide it. Then go back and forth if it needs it. I appreciate you so, so much. Yeah, I appreciate you, <laughs> Google. I have set up here. I, I don't interact with this all that often. <laughs> Okay, so Erica, you have the clicker or laptop the clicker oh, yes, or just so click on here? Yep. Okay. Right there. Hi, everyone. Oh, it's exactly 9 a.m. <laughs> um, we can go ahead and get started. Are you all ready? Erica? Okay. Excellent. Well, hi again. Um, welcome to Merging Climate and Health Data, Interven Data Innovations for a Sustainable Tomorrow. So hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Heck. I'm from APT Associates. I'm the Director of Global Digital Development. Um, at APT. I have a team with me today of three individuals who work at the intersection of climate and health data. Furthest over there is Lucien DeVoe, who's the co-founder of Palindrome Data, a data science implementer specializing in machine learning tools and deployments in low resources environments. Lucien leads um, delivery and talent services at Palindrome and has experience developing, refining, and deploying tools in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, boop. Prior to Palindrome, he worked in the private sector developing data analytics solutions for the digital economy. Erica Troncoso is the digital solutions strategist at Apt Associates. She works across the digital deployment sector, including digital public finance, climate, governance, and digital health. She has particular experience in digital innovation, running and managing innovation challenges, and implementing organizations, as well as emerging technologies, specifically AI and ML. And then lastly, in the middle, Olga Faktorovich allen is the head of climate integration at APT Associates, where she leads an all of APT approach to crisis. This includes working to mainstream climate mitigation and adaptation strategies into housing, health, agriculture, and agri equitable economic growth programming and leading APT's award-winning corporate sustainability program. So as we all know in this room and recognize, climate change's impacts on health are serious and urgent. APT has been working at this intersection of climate and health for a long time. We have strong expertise in both climate and health, and we've been working across sectors at this intersection point for a while. You'll hear a bit more about our work from some of the panelists, including APT's presence at COP28 from Olga in just a minute. At APT, we believe that focusing on the data itself is the key to driving real change. Data is the most meaningful asset running through all aspects of healthcare delivery. Everything else is just a tool that facilitates a functional job to be done. So I think that's a great place to start. And the great place to start here is at the data value chain. In a perfect world, data would be highly valued and demanded and ethically and efficiently used. But data travels a long journey. It gains value as it moves to its highest purpose. In this case, helping to provide foresight to get ahead of the vulnerability curve. This is especially true at the intersection of health and climate. Um, this is where climate data is usually abundant, but it lacks and is rarely used by local communities, government, ministries of health, and donor-funded inter interventions. And other stakeholders in the health are unable to use it due to lack of capacity and tools around data use and sometimes unusable data products. So much work remains to be done to move up the value chain in this space. 
So some of these topics up here will be covered by the panelists in just a minute, but I wanted to briefly touch on how APT approaches this intersection. So to make a real effort to solution here, we've brought teams together at APT to focus on um, these areas that are underpinned by global initiatives, literature, equity, and inclusion. The first integrated data synthesis is premised on first using and integrating open data and building on what exists rather than creating new data ourselves. The second, um, adaptive digital tools is focused in harnessing existing digital health solutions to seamlessly integrate climate considerations, enhancing preparedness, mitigation, and coordination during climate-driven health emergencies. The third, technology interventions, or yeah, technological inter innovations, excuse me, is focused on using evolving technology like AI, machine learning, and internet of things. And then lastly, eco-conscious technology. This prioritizes green designs and practices to significantly reduce the carbon impact of digital health technologies. So I just wanna say here that last one is excluded outside of the scope of this panel, but APT is working in this space. We're part of the Digital Health and Interoperability Small Working Group on Digital Health and Climate. If you're interested in this group's work, if you want to join, you can email digitalhealthandclimate at gmail.com. So lastly, um, at APT, we have strong portfolios that I mentioned and experts in both climate and health. We see digital and in particular, the digital health sector as a key integration point. Um, for mitigating health impacts from climate change and building health systems resilience. This happens via bi-directional mechanisms. That first mechanism and building resilience looks like bringing climate information services and data to the health sector at the health service, health system and service delivery levels. The second way is bringing health data into climate adaptations. This is opening up digital health and digital transformation of health systems to climate information adaptations and making digital health become climate conscious. So some of our projects working in this space include PMI Evolve, where we're working to consider the impact of climate change against the fight against malaria, HETA, or the Health Electrification and Telecommunications Alliance, which is Power Africa's flagship initiative for health facility electrification and digital connectivity in Africa. This project's mission is to catalyze public-private partnerships for sustainable business models that increase access to reliable, renewable energy and digital connectivity. And then lastly, in the Healthy Mother, Healthy Baby project in Tajikistan, which you all will hear about in just a minute. So with that, let me hand it over to Erica. Oh, Olga, sorry, <laughs> to Olga. <laughs> Go right ahead. Oh, and you mean Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. It's great to be here. I'm incredibly excited that this topic is of such importance at this conference because the digital health community really is the linchpin to unlocking the untapped potential of climate information services applied to health, protecting program outcomes, and ultimately saving lives. This is incredibly timely and important. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to um, set the stage a bit more. So today we see what the world is like with 1.14 degrees of warming. Um, three and a half billion people are living in areas of extreme vulnerability to climate change. Um, we see that um, heat stress is actually the most hazardous, uh, largest killer uh, among all climate hazards. Uh, here in the United States, killing more people than any other climate hazard, as well as around the world. What you see behind me is a, a, a map showing mortality for uh, individuals 65 and older. And in the last uh, two decades, mortality from heat stress increased 85%. Um, what we're also seeing is that, um, you know, catastrophic floods in, in Pakistan and, and wildfires in the United States and Australia and Europe. I mean, these are absolute catastrophic events. And again, it's only at 1.14 degrees, right? We're seeing malaria on the rise. Last year, 2022, where we saw a 5 million increase in malaria cases over, over the previous year. Again, it's not just because the Anopheles mosquito is expanding in geographic range because of precipitation and heat. It's also because of those massive floods, for example, in Pakistan, where you know standing water is now, it's, it's perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Populations are displaced. Perhaps those that have low immunity to malaria are now forced to be in malaria endemic areas. 
they're living in refugee camps in tents without insecticide treated nets. So it's compounding and it's uh, exacerbating inequities in health outcomes. We see that dengue is now, it has increased eight folds over the last um, two decades. We're seeing disruption in HIV and AIDS care and TB care. Um, we see, um, you know, uh, mental health uh, suffering from heat stress, from loss of livelihoods and disruption. Um, the physical impacts of, of uh, extreme weather events, like for example, uh, in Malawi, Cyclone Freddy, um, the mortality of the cholera that came after the cyclone uh, is is kind of has has dwarfed the physical um, deaths from the cyclone itself, right? Um, we're seeing air pollution, which of course is very closely linked with climate change from the combustion of fossil fuels, claiming seven million lives a year, um, and and um, you know extensive respiratory disease. Um, COPD, asthma, cogn cognitive decline. We're seeing 3 million preterm births from air pollution because uh, PM 2.5 actually shows up in the placenta, right? So what we're seeing, you know, when I first got into the space, whatever, 16 years ago, the narrative was very much like, oh, climate change is, you know, it's going to be scary in the future. We need to worry about polar bears. <laughs> and that was at 1.1 degree rise. Now it's 1.14 and we're seeing climate changes now. We are living it now. It's disastrous. And the climate crisis is in fact a health crisis, you know, very much so. And uh, I guess lastly, I can't see the slide. Oh, yeah. um, you know, the, the World Health Organization predicts that direct costs to the health sector will be at for a billion dollars a year by 2030. And that excludes health determining sectors, right? So all we need is clean air, clean water, food, shelter, livelihood, all of those things are health determining sectors. So that cost doesn't even embody impacts to those. So again, the climate crisis is a health crisis. Um, on, a, on a more optimistic note, <laughs> I guess now that I started to <laughs> have a negative course, so next slide please. The health community has really mobilized like never before. And what we're seeing is, you know, right now COP28 is happening in Dubai and um, it's, you know, for the first time ever, health impacts of climate change have taken center stage. Um, 40 million health professionals signed a call to action to the negotiators to apply health considerations into uh, climate negotiation. Because at the end of the day, what they're negotiating isn't really the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that might or might not be emitted, it's how many people are going to die from malaria, from dengue, from air pollution. That's what we, that's what they are negotiating. Um, the good news is, is that 95% of the nationally determined contribution uh, now state that climate, uh, that health is a priority sector uh, for uh, climate policy, which is fantastic. Um, we have a, a strong delegation of App Associates colleagues at COP28. Um, we This year, we're actually co-hosting the health topic at the Resilience Hub, focused on climate resilient health systems there. We have programming the World Health Organization Pavilion as well on early warning systems across Africa. Um, and we're very excited to be leading the Comprehensive Action for Climate Change Initiative, which is USAID's flagship program that aims to support um, 80 countries in their development of the national determined contributions and national adaptation plans. Um, so we're incredibly excited um, to be leading that. And again, the, the fact that 95% of NPCs now clearly prioritize state, they're prioritizing health as a sector within climate policy is absolutely fantastic. Um, at this COP, they held the first health ministerial. 90 ministers of health showed up to a climate conference, never <laughs> happened before and articulated how climate is impacting their health sectors in country, their people and what their priorities are. Um, the COP28 declaration on climate and health was signed by 124 countries and endorsed by the ministers of health, which is absolutely fantastic. It, you know, one might say it's symbolic, but what was also announced is a billion dollars in aggregated financing for the, uh, for that declaration. And what I'll say is um, the, you know, of course, important kind of things that that community is advocating for includes emission reductions, because as I just said, you know, you, 
unless we address mitigation, we're going to outstrip our capacity to adapt, period, right? So that's really critical. But the kind of the fundamental foundational need that they're expressing is the need to access climate information services, right? To detect disease, monitor health risks, anticipate problems, and take early, early action. And that's what's really needed. So I guess my message to you all on that slide is, you know, when you're engaging with, with your colleagues uh, in the Ministry of Health, colleagues in the health community, they're going to be open to this. This is a, a key priority now. It's not kind of a side thing. It, it's a really critical key priority for our health colleagues around the world. Uh, next slide. I guess you were there. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so what is the state of, of climate information services? Um, so over the years, um, as, as you probably all know, the, the National Meteorological and Hydrologic Serv Services are kind of the authoritative bodies uh, across uh, the world um, to deliver uh, climate, weather and climate information. And so what is the state of climate information services? Over the years, there's really been a steady increase in their capacity. And what we're seeing is that now 74, so on the, on the left behind me is kind of the uh, the the National Met Services and on the, and on the right this is so awkward because this is behind me <laughs> Sorry. and on the right is the Ministries of of Health some staff so what you see on the left there is that seventy four percent of the NMHSs um, are providing weather and climate data to the Ministries of Health that is fantastic right but what we're seeing on the right is that less than a quarter of ministries of health actually use that information systematically uh, for health surveillance and these uh, surveillance systems. That is a massive disconnect. And you might wonder why, right? Well, when you look at that number right there, back, back on this side, only 31% of the national ministries um, of the uh, national meteorological and hydrological services have the advanced capabilities to provide tailored services to the health sector, right? Um, and tailored means, you know, it's for fit for purpose, if you will. Well, as you all know, you can't design fit for purpose if you don't engage with the end user. And what you see on the bottom right here behind me is that only 14% of ministries of health actually have formal um, uh, collaboration agreements in place to share data, collaborate, and co-create tailored information products. And so this is a massive disconnect between two really critical sets of stakeholders. Um, and, and so what is the result? The result is a woefully unprepared health sector <laughs> to the realities of climate change. We're seeing that only half of the countries around the world have a climate vulnerability and adaptation assessment that is informed by climate information. Uh, what we're also seeing is that only 52% uh, have extreme heat weather warnings. And, you know, while you could be a glass half full kind of person, when you look kind of deeper and double click into the geographic distribution, it's it's mostly those high income countries that have those systems in place. Only 19 percent of low and middle income countries, those lowest in the human development index, have uh, the heat early warning systems in place, which is ludicrous because we know that even a 24 hour notice of an impending event damages by upwards of 30 percent. So most of the world is unprepared, right? Um, okay, next slide. So what are the opportunities for collaboration here? And what are we what are we actually talking about when we say climate information services, right? So from my perspective, I think it's very useful to think of the of climate information services as a value chain. Uh, it's really an interconnected kind of interconnected parts with really, really critical links. And the opportunities for collaboration are really at every single stage of the value chain. So when we say uh, climate services for health, we're really talking about an iterative process, right? Between partners to identify and build capacity to access, develop, deliver, and use relevant, reliable climate knowledge to enhance those decisions uh, in health. Importantly, there is no one size fits all. The climate information product produced depends on the question that you're trying to answer, the need and the local context, right? And so, however, what is true across the board is that the user community has to engage with the service provider community. So if we look at the value chain, right, um, you know, it, it all starts with the basic measurement of weather and climate phenomena, right? So weather is the state of the atmosphere at a particular time and place. And it's kind of measured through temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, 
wind speed, et cetera. Um, Ground-based observations are absolutely the gold standard. Uh, some measurement devices are super rudimentary and kind of paper handwritten records being aggregated maybe on a monthly basis, while on the other side, it's, it's kind of fancy sensors with real-time kind of aggregation capabilities and analyses. Um, there are global climate monitoring products uh, that have to be downscaled uh, appropriately to be meaningful. Um, and there's, you know, as you move to the right from data collection development of information products, there is tremendous amount of innovation happening. And you'll hear some of that today, which is incredibly exciting um, across the value chain there um, because the service provider community is expanding beyond the med services to academia, NGOs, private sector, um, it, incredibly exciting and innovating tools AI, machine learning, et cetera. I think the problem though, is that there's really a blockage uh, from getting those proof points, proof, sorry, those proof of concepts um, into mainstream decision-making, right? That really supports kind of that authoritative, reliable and sustainable way of informing decisions across the system. And so as you move from left to right there behind me, much of the value chain gets weaker as we move to the right. Um, Okay, uh, next slide, last one. And so what decisions are able to be affected by climate information services in health? And there are so many. Um, health practitioners can use climate data to improve routine planning and surveillance, preparedness activities, um, set appropriate and localized risk thresholds. That's incredibly important. In, uh, inform supply chain flows, like, um, health workforce deployment, uh, patient level risk uh, and diagnostics, prioritize scheduling depending on weather forecasts and outlooks, and the type of climate information service required from nowcasts that are like six to 12 hours ahead to weekly or monthly um, or seasonal. It really depends with the health problem and the decision that is being addressed. You have to start there, right? You have to start there and to, uh, to then understand what is the appropriate temporal resolution uh, for your decision-making for that particular decision. Uh, what is the geographic scale and resolution that is acceptable for you to make that decision? Um, and then is the data available? Um, so uh, with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Erica. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Olga. That was really super interesting. I mean, I just learned <laughs> so much. Also, I'm very excited to talk to you all today, um, this morning on the last day of the conference about the uh, unique intersection that digital health um, and data practitioners can play at this intersection um, and supporting a lot of what Olga has already said um, and taking uh, some of that um, those those steps further down the uh, also down the value chain <laughs> that you were talking about. Um, so as we navigate the digitalization of the health sector in general, um, we're faced with a dual reality. So on one hand, there's potential threat through e-waste, energy consumption, and resource depletion. But on the other hand, um, it's an, digital health is an indispensable tool for combating climate change impacts on health. And we're talking about using digital health to mitigate risks, prepare for disasters, and optimize resources, um, which can include a couple of different you know, te uh, techniques here in the sector, environmental monitoring, data analysis, modeling, and surveillance. Um, but typically, you know, we have uh, three levels of digital health interventions that we like to talk about, which is the individual, the health um, worker, and the health system level. Um, and so uh, as practitioners, we need to use and develop um, and support these uh, interventions, different levels of interventions that support the functional and bi-directional intersection of climate and health data. So at the individual level, um, we can start to utilize the client engagement platforms, such as chatbots, SMS, to deliver the crucial health and climate information directly into the hands of the patients. Um, at the healthcare worker level, we're focusing on uh, capacity building to make sure that they're climate smart, um, which means equipping them with the digital tools they need to make climate informed decision making. Um, and at the health system level, uh, integrating climate data into the existing digital and data platforms 
will be crucial for creating these early warning systems that are applicable and usable at the national and even donor levels. So across the board, all of these digital health interventions have the potential each to include and support prevention, monitoring, risk mitigation, <clears throat> and planning of climate impacts on health. But it's clear that uh, investments need to be made at this intersection. Um, and we must start to adapt our digital tools um, and health data systems to incorporate climate data, making them resilient in the face of climate change. So one of the uh, key focus areas here is about making that data useful. So when we discuss climate and health data, we're looking at a landscape of where there's an abundance of climate information that's underutilized. I think Olga talked a lot about that. Um, and despite its availability, um, it's again, rarely used by the local communities, governments and health sector stakeholders to drive um, this decision-making. And it's really due to lack of capacity and specifically, I wanna highlight for this group, the tools for effective use. Um, and so as digital health practitioners, we need to start to tackle the barriers that prevent this effective use of climate data. Um, we need to start to think about hyper-localized and contextualized climate data to inform community health decisions. And the goal is really to tailor this information to the needs of various audiences, ensuring that it's both relevant and actionable. So for example, we like to um, use AI and machine learning at apps. Um, but one of the big questions that we've given a lot of thought to is what is the point of predicting climate related health risks if the health workers aren't equipped to act on these predictions? They don't know what to do with that information. Um, it's going to be pretty much useless. And so it just um, shows that our approach needs to be multifaceted. It can't just be about data and modeling but it also has to have other components like capacity building as well. Okay. So um, as we as we pivot to this um, data use theme, uh, equity and inclusion comes up uh, paramount here. So it's vital to you know, recognize how climate change is poised to escalate the health risks, um, particularly in LMICs, um, and that this phenomenon isn't you know, uh, affecting everyone equally. You know, Olga also shared a lot about that. Um, but in the face of this reality, our strategy must revolve around two non-negotiables. One is inclusive data, and the other is cross-sector data integration. So we're, as Olga described, sorry, this just let me perfectly. <laughs> um, the, the climate impacts stretch be far beyond the traditional confines of sector-specific siloed data. Um, our approach needs to be interconnected. So we need to start looking across the different data set and different systems to approach this um, in an inclusive manner. So one of, central to our efforts, one of the, um, the points here is the concept of placing community priorities at the forefront. So it's not just about collecting the data anymore, it's really about harnessing this data um, to propel the community-centric goals in climate and, health change, uh, climate and health change. We're advocating for democratizing data science, um, viewing it as a human right in some cases, that every individual should have the opportunity to pose their scientific questions to actively participate in this research and figuring it out um, and be part of that whole data-driven journey uh, towards resilience in the face of these climate and health challenges. So how do we um, translate this vision into action? Seems very lofty, but um, the role of dis multidisciplinary teams here uh, becomes paramount. Um, the teams need to bridge the gap between the local and global skills. Um, and local stakeholders are actually at the center of making sense of this data in a lot of cases. Um, they bring the context, the understanding, the relevancy that just can't be ignored. And on the other hand, the global stakeholders play a pivotal role in the oper operationalization of these insights. So supporting the stewardship and implementation of these initiatives. 
Um, and this is the synergy in data utilization that will drive the effective solutions that we're looking for. Um, and lastly, I just want to emphasize and highlight the capacity building and um, community engagement again. So um, when we're thinking about building local capacity, it's not about just imparting knowledge, right? It's about empowering the communities to understand and utilize the data effectively. And it usually involves transforming these complex, often very overwhelming global or national data sets into practical and actionable tools for local decision makers. Um, so right now we are working on a project in Tajikistan. Um, we are analyzing ANC service delivery data from APPS USAID funded Healthy Mother, Healthy Baby project in Tajikistan. We are working with the Hydro Meteorological Agency of Tajikistan um, who have provided weather data with our um, to our teams. And we're also working with Palindrome data um, who's seen here um, and the whole team there to, pro to develop uh, predictive climate and health risk models. So what we have found so far is that the rumors are true. The Catalan province where we have the project work is experiencing climate change. <laughs> in the month of July, you'll see in the, um, the graph here, um, there's a significant 2.4 Celsius increase in average temperature from over 14 years, um, as well as a change in the minimum and maximum temperatures over this period, consistent across weather stations. The health risks and impacts are um, are, are very uh, dynamic here. So a lot of, of thought has been put into exactly what kind of climate information um, and data that we bring into um, these models. But it ha we have found that the weather and climate does indeed have an impact on maternal health outcomes in Tajikistan. And this is aligned with the global literature, right? Um, so we have also now built a machine learning model, um, which predicts the risk of maternal health outcomes correlated with the risk of impact due to climate and uh, climate related events. Our models can now predict the risk of preeclampsia um, by incorporating rainfall data um, and temperature data. Uh, we can also predict anemia, um, which looks at the similar weather patterns um, to determine that risk. And eventually the goal for us is to put these risk, risk scores and insights back into the hands of decision makers, whether they are the individual patients themselves, healthcare workers who are providing the services, or at the programmatic level about um, uh, resource optimization and building the system resilience. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Lucien to dive deeper into Thank you, Erika. Um, I'm actually going to stand if that's okay. Um, and I might come and change yep, on slides. I was like, I hope you guys are all well. <laughs> um, so a little bit about what we've been talking about today, some of the practical implica implications and what are the tools that we can start building. And um, the work we've been doing in Tajikistan is just one of them, an example perhaps that we can uh, delve into today. Um, one of the first things we do as a data science company, of course, is to do some data discovery. And that was kind of figuring out what the climate data was available, what healthcare data was available, and then bringing those two together. So merging them, making sure they come across the same timeline um, and then start figuring out what are the outcomes that we can actually predict. So do we have good inputs to kind of figure out and put into our models that can predict those outcomes? Uh, and uh, as with all projects, there's some good data and there's some bad data. Um, and you've got to kind of uh, sift through things. And then as you see on the slide, there's some good maternal stuff, um, very sparse data perhaps on childhood development, breastfeeding, which are actually really important outcomes, but we have to kind of um, take out the scope because the data just wasn't supportive of those types of analysis. Uh, and then we come up with this list, right? So what are the key outcomes that we are able to kind of prioritize? Uh, I think you guys are, might be aware that the modeling can take some time and it's quite iterative and so we want to be sure that you know whatever we, we whichever outcomes we choose to uh, explore 
we are going to have sufficient data and the robustness of the models are going to be able to be operationalized at some stage. Um, and in this case, we had healthcare data that was only um, a few months um, given the uh, sourcing of the data. We had lots and lots of climate uh, data, but of course you have to pull them together and it's almost the intersection of that timeline that allows us to um, build these models. <clears throat> so some of the proposed functionality. So uh, a lot of what we do is build, build these machine learning models, figure out which outcomes we are able to predict with a certain amount of confidence. And then the hardest part is figuring out how to make that useful to someone in a facility, in a fairly remote area, and kind of how to operationalize those insights. Uh, so there's four kind of ideas that we have, and we've been working quite closely again with the Tajikistan um, programmatic team to kind of figure out if we show you this, is this going to be helpful? If we kind of um, give you this bit of information at that point of care, um, can that be useful? And then can we give you some ideas in terms of interventions about what to do uh, in those scenarios? And that's a very collaborative process, um, but it really is the meat, I think, of some of these projects. Uh, so I'll go through each of these really quickly. Um, the first one kind of looking at uh, integrating the score into an existing app. And, and one of the things that I've um, become a little bit, you know, on my soapbox about is, we probably have a lot of tools out there um, and we may need to just rethink how many more shiny new things we want to build. Um, and perhaps what's really more useful to the healthcare worker is embedding some of these insights and embedding some of these um, sort of models inside an existing app. So again, we were very fortunate um, to have this Comcare app already developed and in use. That's actually where we source the operational data set to build the model, which is great because no new data now needs to be collected. They're already doing um, that. And so we could just take the model that we built and embed it into this Comcare app um, and kind of build a little bit of a risk score. And so we have a, a risk score that gets calculated um, in real time, because again, these models, once they've been trained and tested, we can actually now put that on a very low spec device and it's kind of like weighted uh, rule based kind of opportunity to calculate these risk scores and we can again figure out is this patient at high low medium risk for preeclampsia let's say in this case um, and then we kind of uh, allow for some suggested intervention packages and and what we are not doing is kind of being prescriptive about what needs to happen for that patient necessarily. We are simply augmenting the decision-making capabilities of, of the healthcare worker. They often have quite a lot of good um, uh, insight and, and, and ability to figure out what's going on in the underlying causes for the patient's risk. And, and that's where we really lean on them quite a lot. Oh, that's awesome. I just saw that delete slide. But um, so <laughs> um, let's talk about this, the second one, which is a little bit more of, you know, a patient list. So the example I showed you first was for an individual patient, what's going on them? What are the underlying risk drivers for them? Um, and, and now this is just a little bit more of like a batch version. So if I were to take my entire facility, can I rank order them by risk? And perhaps I need to call 20 people today, which are the 20 that I need to either do a home visit for, a home consultation, or just make sure like when temperatures are rising, because again, we, we kind of pulling in that climate data, and um, we now see everybody's risk gets elevated. What are we able to do about that um, real quick? Uh, and again, very similar types of interventions, but again, you're able to do this on a on a, a much kind of bigger scale in terms of the facility or the program or the whole region. Um, and then uh, a simpler, maybe more uh, direct to patient use case would be to actually send information to the patients um, that are identified as having an elevated risk. And this could be something as simple as just saying, hey, we've noticed that, you know, we've seen some um, extreme weather events. Um, you might want to just, you know, hydrate, stay inside, those kinds of things. And if those messages can be personalized and targeted, I think that's when you start to see a little bit more uh, receptiveness to these types of information. Um, and then the last one was kind of uh, this much higher level sort of programmatic HQ type solution where 
if we are able to see different weather, weather patterns across the region um, and identify maybe a pocket where some um, folks are seeing a spike in risk, while other um, sub-districts might be having a reduced risk, because now we can start aggregating all the individual patients and, and figure out which regions are going to have more need and more demand, you can now start shifting um, folks or deploying your resources a little better. So this one's again, um, at sort of the decision-making on, on the HQ or resource level. And we might you know, show this on a map and give folks a little bit more of a visual uh, aid on that. Um, that's me. Um, so I think we're gonna move to the question. Thank you all so much. Uh, for your insights here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I would urge you all in the crowd, if you have questions about any of the topics that were discussed today, to please find these three. You have, I don't know, three quarters of a day left here at the conference, um, but they'll also be around after if you have questions um, and want some more insights from them. So let me start with a couple of questions. Uh, what are some of the barriers to co-producing and implementing climate services for health? Yeah. Sure. Please. Um, yeah. So I would say one of the biggest barriers um, right now is the length of time that it takes to uh, bring, uh, create these really, really robust um, resilience systems, right? That's the vision, that's the long term goal. Um, and really kind of finding smaller uh, pieces that we can tackle today and kind of figuring out this whole process. What is this going to look like? Um, and when we sit down to do it, I mean, ultimately the goal is going to be a very you know, robust, complex system. But what are some small pieces that can um, we can put into, again, the hands of healthcare workers or the, directly into the hands of patients that um, that we can figure out and, and actually do today. And so, you know, I think one of the barriers is we try to um, we're, we are thinking at thinking about this problem at multiple different levels. And while we're trying to get to that ultimate, like very robust, um, long term, you know, early warning systems uh, and surveillance systems, um, I think that trying to figure out what we can do today. Um, is is sometimes uh, easier, so or or can be helpful to overcome that barrier of that staring down that long uh, timeline. Um, I would say another barrier is a uh, lack of financial resources. <laughs> uh, we know that our health systems are understaffed, under resourced, and kind of tapped out as is, even without the additional strain that climate change causes. Um, and I, I mentioned the 95% of the national determined contributions mentioned health as a priority, while only 2% of adaptation funding is currently uh, dedicated to health. That is a massive misalignment, right? Um, and so uh, I think there's an opportunity to ensure that um, kind of addressing climate risk is embedded in our programming as kind of a key outcome, because frankly, it protects the investment of the donor community, the taxpayer community, it protects uh, investment, right? Because whether kind of we politically believe in it or, or whatnot, um, the physical manifestations of climate change are going to disrupt health programming, period. Um, and so I think advocating for very explicit um, you know, the scope of work to include climate resilience uh, is really, really critical and uh, folks should not shy away from that. Yes. So although 95% of the NDCs uh, prioritize uh, the health, um, only 2% um, of adaptation funding uh, is dedicated to health. Massive misalignment. So I'll just add to that. What is step one? I'm imagining a lot of folks in this crowd are part of health projects um, or aligned to projects. Maybe you don't have explicit funding for climate, but you're interested. What's the first step a project, a program can take to include considerations of climate? <laughs> Sorry to have me ask. Yeah. Um, actually, I love Lucien's example because it, it like in real life, it kind of tells you what the step one is, right? Um, 
I think step one is really, it's not anything fancy or sexy or a new shiny tool or anything like that. It's actually engaging directly with the end user, right? And actually I would, I would say for health project is doing a qualitative risk screening of seeing the outcomes and your operations and how those are or are not affected by climate and weather. So from there, um, you have to understand then, okay, you know, what are the decisions, the health decisions that my program will make and at what time scale, what is the geographic scope, right? And then you're really engaging with the data providers and, and, and really trying to see, okay, what is the, um, the value chain in the country that you're operating in, that climate information system value chain, services value chain, right? Who are the players? What is the state of data, et cetera? But you have to start um, at the question, contextualize, um, not at the fancy stuff. Yeah, and just to add into that, you know, that's something that we've seen time and time again in the field is we often, as whether whether it's a machine learning modelers or data scientists or tool builders coming in too late and we're not getting that um, time on the ground with the end users um, and just kind of understanding the the, the realities of the working environment. Often we're building tools that unfortunately are not fit for purpose, but we have these grand, amazing ideas um, that comes and bumps up against reality. And you find out quite quickly that you made a bit of a oopsie. Um, and so getting, you know, the, the tool builders out there on the ground, um, we have our data scientists, data scientists kind of sit in with our programmatic folks and um, be in the facility to kind of just understand the nuances of how the workflow is going to work and where that tool needs to be kind of um, able to support those decisions. So that, that I think, you know, I, I can't, again, uh, advocate for us coming in earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I just, this brings me back to kind of the, the core question here, which is who to do what to and when, right? So you want to make sure you kind of have that um, somewhat formulated, at least with, you know, the end users getting their input, um, what are they actually seeing? And that's what we kind of, how this project started, the one in Tajikistan is we heard from our, um, our colleagues in Tajikistan saying, you know, there, there is a problem here. We are suffering from air quality, um, being over in it's off the chart of the index, actually. Um, we're having extreme heat events. Uh, there has to be something here in the data and where we would like to start to like look at this in order to develop a mitigation strategy. So, you know, practically step one was bringing together the project team, the data teams, the you know partners um, from both the hydrometeorological agency and our project team, also the Ministries of Health, to come together and really sit down and say, okay, what can we do here? What data can we share? What's possible? Um, and what is the impact that we're looking for? You know, in terms of who is it? Who are who are these insights for? Um, of course, after we had that conversation, everyone was like, me, me, me. Right? Like at all levels, we want to share that information back. Um, so th I think that's our second step now, <laughs> but, um, yeah, bringing people together is step one. <laughs> Thank you for that. So you all touched a little bit on maybe more so building of the model, starting to integrate the data. Um, what about implementing that work, right? You, you have a model that's producing some type of result. How do you go about implementing? What are some of the considerations projects to think about in terms of implementation, whether that's capacity strengthening, governance of data, what does that look like to actually get these um, models working in a project? Um, yeah, and I would say however hard it is to get all your data sources aligned and pulling in all your partnerships, the operationalization of the stuff is just so much harder. So I think our focus really needs to be on that change management sort of process. And, you know, we're not necessarily going for this radical kind of change management. Uh, there's an iterative kind of continuous improvement that these models and these um, new, let's say, features or functionality that we can add to the tools that, um, that will allow us to not be too disruptive and add incremental value um, very quickly. And so I, I think getting in the ground, on the ground, doing some user testing, getting their feedback, and then the short turnaround time between, you know, 
healthcare worker says this is working, this isn't working, and then be able to kind of amplify whatever the feedback is, that's going to get the buy-in that you need. Because at the end of the day, you 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 really need their support and them to kind of love and get the value out of the tools. Um, otherwise, you, you just see so many of these things flounder and sort of not kind of uh, sort of wither at the vine. Yeah, I'll also add that, um, you know, I think, Kristen, you mentioned this. It, it's really important to um, look at the existing tools. So what are people already using? What uh, systems already exist? In this case, it was ComCare. Okay, so let's work within that, um, what people are used to. Um, and it, really trying to think about the workflow. So um, again, this goes back to data use, right? So what, how is a work a healthcare worker going throughout her day and where would this information be most relevant? Would it be most applicable, most useful in order for her to feel empowered enough to make decisions and act on it? Um, and so really trying to think about that uh, perspective. Um, so it's not, and, and it's not just at the, um, the healthcare worker level in a lot of cases, but you know, a lot of cases we're talking about the national level as well. So again, trying to think about those critical decision points and um, what kind of information needs to be tailored to which person, which user, which stakeholder at the right time. Um, I'll just maybe pick up on one thing um, also, Erica, that you mentioned kind of in terms of what tools already exist and integrating anything like this into existing workflows is just so critical for sustainability. Um, for um, DHIS2 comes to mind <laughs> from that perspective. Um, APT is leading the PMI Evolve uh, project, which is USAID's flagship um, malaria eradication program. We're operating in over 20 countries. Um, you know, and we've, we've led several iterations of that program and have protected more than 30 million people from malaria a year, uh, by it, through indoor residual spraying and, uh, distribution of insecticide treated nets and, um, kind of groundbreaking entomological research. But what we're doing right now is, and we're just in the beginning of it is, um, thinking through how to integrate climate and weather information into DHIS2 to inform the entomological research that we're doing on the ground and to inform our operations on the ground. It's a highly like intense logistical, um, challenge, uh, as, as you might imagine. And, uh, what's really exciting is the Wellcome Trust has recently, um, has recently granted uh, the Oslo Institute, DHIS2, um, $15 million, I think, for kind of a starter climate uh, to integrate climate and weather in information into DHIS2. Now that I think is groundbreaking, right? With, you know, what, 3 billion people using DHIS2 over 80 ministries of health. I mean, talk about, you know, it's not that you build and they and they shall come. That's that's really not the case in these under-resourced settings, right? You really need to think about the local, what are the people using right now, what is available, and how can we seamlessly inter in integrate this to then expand the insight available to them to make their decisions. So I think I'm super excited um, about the level of innovation happening all over the world around this and at APT. Thank you. That actually brings me very well to my next question, which is, so talking about DHIS2 being a source for, you know, a place for some of that data integration or a place to work with different sets of data, what are some of the realities of integrating those data sets, right? Of getting access to data to allowing that intersection to happen or that intermingling? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so these, these are, are Typical data sharing challenges. I think there's a lot of new strategies, or not new, I would say, um, but uh, interesting strategies that we can um, use here. So, um, you know, using um, APIs is really helpful. A lot of <laughs> countries and and people who don't use data and digital tools every day don't know what APIs are. And so when you say data sharing to them, they're like, oh, I have to give you all of my data. And it, it just feels very um, overwhelming. It feels like they they have no control. Um, and so we try to kind of, <laughs> we've been thinking about this from, um, from a platform perspective, you, you know, using uh, 
lowering the bar of um, the terms that we use, but showing them, demonstrating them with platforms. So data visualization is really helpful here, saying like we have connected several data sources to build kind of a visualization of what um, is useful for you. And this is tailored to your needs. And yes, it's pulling in data from different sources, but it's not necessarily like we are the owners of the data. It's still within your own um, uh, you know, offices, ministry, op whatever it may be. Um, so that is one of the yeah considerations I was saying. Maybe one that I would just like to mention is kind of um, just educating users, bureaucracies, you know, folks who are needing to kind of understand the, the rule book maybe about what is possible, what isn't possible. Um, I, I worked in the U.S. for a long time and there's a very mature sort of data ecosystem and folks kind of know the rules. And of course, there's lots of regulatory compliance that goes into that. Um, and with GDPR and a lot of the other uh, you know, lower resource countries kind of developing their own privacy and security laws. I think there's a lot of um, just education and, and and need to to make sure people understand what this means exactly. And for example, a lot of the data we use for mod modeling is de-identified. So we did, your name has no use to us in terms of understanding uh, whether you're going to um, have a risk event or not. And there's just like a lot of um, things we can do and security we can put into place um, to make folks feel comfortable, uh, but there's still quite a lot of hesitancy just because of, you know, the confused mind says no. And so that education, I think, is probably the, the most important part of our jobs in that early stage. So, Lucy, you just mentioned something, and you all have touched on this in a little bit of different ways. Um, the complexity of this work, um, the risk involved in this work, right? How do you start to think about getting funders who are traditionally maybe more risk adverse or governments who are risk adverse to think about funding initiatives in this space? Um, ask another way, what are some ways to de-risk some of these projects, right? So you can think about um, incorporating funding or considerations of funding for projects like these. Yeah, maybe again, just really quickly, I, I don't think we need to take on these multi-year massive kind of um, projects necessarily. I'd always advocate to start small, something low fidelity, use existing data. Like there's so much um, usefulness that's in the data that's already being collected that we aren't leveraging and tapping into. And so that right there, it, it seems to be like a very uh, low hanging fruit, if I can say, to kind of show a little bit of value and then iterate and build on uh, from that. Um, so I actually think, you know, we, we should be understanding that there is risk, but we can build something that can show a lot of value in a very short period of time. Um, and that's kind of how you, you convince people to um, open their pockets maybe a little more and going forward. Um, on, a, on a bit of a kind of um, higher level, I guess I would say, um, similarly to bringing the service providers and the users of data together, we got to bring the donors together. <laughs> the donors that are investing in global health with the donors that are investing in climate action and adaptation, right? We, we need the health sector to be able to access climate financing. Now we are starting out finally, you know, especially after the top, um, the green climate fund has, uh, recently, uh, uh, funded its first health uh, intervention in Laos, strengthening the health sector. Um, so that's fantastic, but it's, it's we're like right at the beginning of it, right? And so again, bringing all of these aspects of the communities together to really understand how interconnected all of this is and how critical it is for all levels to be working together. And we need to put our financing and our resourcing together because uh, it's a massive problem. Yeah, and I'll say too that... Um like this project and others, I think finding um, a small opportunity to, as you said, de-risk some of this in a, uh, innovation or kind of trying to bring together these uh, different sectors and the data that exists, building on and opening up existing digital health tools and systems um, really provides a good proof point, a solid proof point evidence that you can go to hopefully some of these donors um, and show them and say, hey, this is, we've invested um, at this point. It's a mitigation just in itself to bring to get, 
together this data um, and start to develop this. And, you know, I think a lot of the donors that we're seeing today um, are more uh, climate conscious. They're starting to kind of bring this to bring this into their thinking, bringing it into their strategies, and um, hopefully that this will these kinds of activities will pique their interest, and we'll all start to kind of build that momentum towards getting larger, more intersectional funding. With that, the last question I'd like to ask is just, what does this look like practically to address the disparities? We all know climate change disproportionately impacts some communities more than others. What does that look like in these projects? Yeah, so as we have been talking about, I mean, there are these existing large disparities. I mean, a lot of the populations that we're actually talking about who will experience these health um, impacts from climate change are very high on the vulnerability index. Um, they don't have the systems that are existing to be able to um, to bring this together. So I, I yeah, I just want to highlight my points before is that making sure that this data is actually usable by those lo local communities is going to be paramount. So how can we start to think about uh, again, starting to become more locally led, bringing those voices at, at the table to start with, to develop some of these solutions, um, to think through what this will look like, what is actually tangible for them, um, and elevating and prioritizing the community priorities. Um, I think that's going to be just super difficult because of a lot of the processes that we're that we are um, held to, especially in the global global development sector. Um, but I think that we are creative and we we are innovative as a community, the digital health community, and there are absolutely ways to um, to get to these uh, uh, people and then um, you know have, start co-creating and co-collaborating, co-designing um, in the truest version of that. You know, I'll just shamelessly plug like having local folks like we out of we. We were founded in South Africa. We there. We kind of do a lot of our work in southern sub-Saharan Africa. I think that does matter and it is helpful. Um, so I think wherever possible, find local providers, find local people who I think just increases the sustainability of these projects. Um, so yeah. That was a great note to end on. So thank you, Lucian, Olga, Erica. Thank you all for attending. Again, find these three if you have any questions later on. Um, have a good rest of your conference. Thanks.